all right before you even start how i get into the gang um sometimes you get into a group not even knowing that it's a gang actually you know you just tell yourself this is a group of friends and brotherhood you know just hanging and chilling with each other and then before you know you form end up forming a what we will call a gang and i think what happens in today's society is that we tend to not believe there are gangs because we don't call it gangs we just call it other mm -hmm. people days and you know they chill together and what's not but then eventually it forms to something much more you know diabolical so um mm -hmm. i would say it first started um in the secondary school um yeah. secondary school yeah in secondary school you know just a group of friends hanging out with each other um it could be because of what part you live it could be due to the fact that you either left primary school and went into secondary school or it could be the fact that you live in a particular area so it was like town versus country and then you know we start farming little cliques and we start farming and the sad thing about it is that um spirit recognize spirit and a lot of us came from dysfunctional homes and the sad thing about it is that sometimes you recognize pain between each other and mm -hmm. born not even know why we born and so Zico, well, tell me please because sometimes we say this thing and we don't want to say with school yeah um, you know where did you go to school grantley adams so you were at grantley adams and you're yeah. saying that's really where it started where you started to identify with a certain type of people that you Correct. felt comfortable with exactly um in primary school i was i i started out very young i was doing a lot of mischievous things in primary school coming up i was in a lot of fights um i was searching see if i could get a little weed or a little cigarette to smoke you know at primary, school? At primary school yeah um I also to where it was raised where it was raised was in the city well known as nelson street um oh, so i was at okay. sports i was at sports from young to long uh, these activities not necessarily even knowing that it's a bad thing because everybody was doing it i didn't even know having a job was a real thing so we coming up that just seemed very normal so you know you're going out with the boys and you say like my father left a split here you want to try this here even smoking tea bags you'll take out the the herb out to the tea bag and you'll hold up a paper and you started like that <laughs> wait 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 you know a, a, a lot of us i remember doing that you go and, yeah. and get the dry leaf and 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 think and try to smoke it you know you yeah. know a lot of, a lot of your little children because you, you're following the adults right yep and so in primary school you were trying out some of those things too exactly so in primary school that's basically how we started um i started with just my brother could have smoked we would smoke we were hide and smoke it uh we thought it was just a cool thing you know we see we see growing up doing it and we thought that was a cool thing um especially as a young man looking up to other men as well and knowing where where, where he was living at the time that was just enormous everybody was smoking so why not do it and it started like that and it was getting us a lot of different fights and stuff like that my mother had got married and i felt like i was being kind of replaced in a way and i started to act out in a lot of strange ways you, have, you was, have other brothers and sisters when your mom yeah got but married? my brother my brother is 10 years younger than me been nine ten years younger than me ah. so at the time it was just me and my mom at the time and when she got married when she got married she i was then sent by my grandmother um which was also in elster street as well she had left and she had basically moved out so i spent a lot of time with my grandma and i kind of felt abandoned in a sense um you probably don't know how to verbalize it or express it at that time so i started to act out in a lot of weird ways and getting into a lot of mischief got transferred um the first thing i stabbed a, 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 a boy with a pencil at school in his face with a pencil then i got transferred went to hillaby turner soul and then from there we i just continued then got into secondary school um that's where it really basically started from there he was like, oh, they will never forget this. My first week into secondary school, first week, it's probably must even my second day, I saw someone here got chopped right off. Chopped right what? off, hanging off his face. There was this huge fight hanging off his face. And I never forget, I was telling myself, this place, that can never be me. You know, and then it put this killed or be killed mentality. So like, you know, these fight or flight responses. And I was like, yeah, I gonna fight if anything happened, like, I can't show fear. I can't show, and that was me. I always attack things that I feared. So um, anybody who I felt was a threat at the time, I would probably attack. And with that kind of mentality, I probably grew 
he put knew me for some white hours like yeah he liked violence he like you know he liked fighting mm -hmm. he liked doing but really and truly it was fear you know yes, yes, and yes, a lot of yes. people tend to see young people doing things not understanding that sometimes they be acting out of fear not just because or oh, they just want to be bad boys but really and truly it's fear behind all the tough exterior and everything these cool face and all that it was really and truly fear i'm like a lot back in it i see now but i remember then going to school we used to wear a black shirt every friday and we used to call mm -hmm. ourselves the luck and luck off crew we started off the luck and luck off crew and we would defend each other um coming up uh fight against other schools tongue versus country and it started like that and you were going to a little mischief do a lot of crazy stuff like that you know petty crimes and stuff like that then it continued to develop even more and more and more um the reason why i had left secondary school was because some people some men had came to the schools with guns for me yes i remember no i yeah. remember i i would know the whole thing is coming back when we met you yes yeah so, so go over that so you 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 i want you know tamika i'm with you on this one tamika is saying listen to zika well people children have feelings even if they can't verbalize or express themselves and as a mother there's some mistakes that i've made as well but you know you didn't listen to the children properly and this is a good time for us to really think about that that we've got to listen to them listen to what what they're saying so you're you're basically saying that you did not go and say well we're going to start a gang you just started to find the people that you had things in common with and yeah. you started to, to to defend each other because you're yep. in a school where you saw people chop off people's ears and then you then you started to you know wear the same colors everybody was wearing black so you said yeah. you would go into town and you would do petty crimes. Like what? What do you what do you call petty crimes? Um, we were going to town, uh, beat the homeless. Um, sometimes beat we the would, homeless? yeah. All right, okay, no judgment. Yeah. And I'm not um, fucking beat the homeless for what? Oh, uh, it was just, it was just. I guess the, uh, you know, to prove. Hey, I have no idea. I can't. I have no. I can't even explain why we was doing it. We just thought it was fun. Um, okay. We thought it was fun. Um, just being lawless, going going to town, beat the homeless, uh, robbing robbing people, doing crazy stuff like that at a young age, basically. Right, and you, um, you were in you were in, uh, in. So, what age did you did you say to yourself, "This is a gang"? It wasn't even seen as a gang yet. It was just seen like, "Yeah, that's that's your family." It really happened when I left school. But coming back to that, I remember I had so it was in a war between tongue versus country. Yeah. And yeah. And what had happened was that some guys who had finished school, I mean, men, men came to the schools with guns for me. And due to the fact that I told you that I used to attack what it is that I feared, I actually rushed at these men, even knowing that they had guns. And I remember the teachers trying to grab me and walk snot and trying to stop me from happening. At the same time, so I had called the police. Police came and took us all up and carried and took us to the station. And while at the station, my mom ended up coming to the station and my mother was like, This is dangerous, Zico. Um, I feel like I'm pulling over school because I don't like this and that thing. I hear that my son dead, and you know, a fear of a mother, because that was a very serious thing for she to experience, basically knowing that someone came to the school um trying to harm me and i remember there was a particular teacher his name was mr griffith he he was upset that i had to left school he was basically my he taught math and he also did p and i was into sports and he didn't mm -hmm. want me to leave he was actually working with me he did not want me to leave at all and he was like he understand and then i left school what, what age was this um what age this was, was this not probably age 15 going 16. Hmm. right so then i left and then my mom was like you got if anything you can go and do school outside the school you can go in your new classes and what's not and you can get a job my mother pulled me out of school the friday monday my mother had a job for me <laughs> monday, my mother had what, were you doing? what kind of job was that my mother had me working at um larry dash as a storeroom clerk ah yeah my mother was like i ain't got you not working bum 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 so two tools my mother had me working 
Um, so leaving school now, it was different. This is where now, um, it was no longer me chilling with the same friends I was going to school with. I was actually you know, into like basically the real world. Mm -hmm. And this is where I ended up joining a, a gang by the name of Crips. Crips? Yeah. In Barbados. So you had a gang by the name of Crips in Barbados. Yeah. What had happened was at that time, it was you rise because a lot of the parties had came back from the United States into Barbados. So there was a lot of bloods and crips. So the culture from the states came into Barbados. And we was kind of indoctrinated in a sense. And then they had the rappers who was glorifying this kind of gang culture, claiming to be blood or claiming to be a crip at the time. And some dependent, and the thing about the bloods or crips, which was different, was that it was never dependent upon where you lived. It was never dependent upon who you know, as long as you basically represented this internationally, you was known to be part of that particular gang. And it was very well. Well, let me ask you, how did they, how did they, how did you join? Like, were you recruited? Yeah. What had happened was it, to join the gang basically is an initiation. We were actually beat into the gang. You beat into the gang? Yeah. Explain. Which is like, which is like we call it jumping or prepping, which is like for, you, for like 60 seconds, basically, or 30 seconds. A whole group of guys were bumping and started beat you. And you had to show your toughness to be able to last within, you know, oh, checking it out to show that you could basically last. And that's your first initiation into the gang. So that's the initiation. But how did you know about them? Is it? Um, first I start. I first I start seeing. Um, you know, I start seeing some fellas with some the, the blue, the blue, the blue scars in the left pocket with some beads around the neck. You know, so I start start seeing. You know. So I started thinking, like, what's this here already going on? Like, wait, is that, you know, was this here really all about? And then I uh, just said, I had rappers, so then it was very internationally known what was a blend and what was a crit. So it was mm -hmm. the same in Barbados, which was very different. It was crazy to me. I was like, all right, this is very strange. And then I realized that it came across a lot of old heads who was like, yeah, that was about here for a while. They just know that, you know, it may not probably have to account the name Chris, you probably would have a set name. When they say a set name, a little block name, but under the same principles or code of the particular gang. Um, and within this gang, there's an OG, which is basically the head of the particular gang. And then underneath, you basically work your way up. So I basically work my way up, don't start doing small little petty things to eventually build my cred. And that's how you basically build ranks to make your way up to um, up the chain, up the line. Um, and this time, when you actually you left school about 15 16 and what age did you join this this gang? Well, as soon as i basically left as soon as i left ah. basically yeah because i remember seeing it well going to school because it was around you know it was around and then i started linking up with some fellas who was crips and you know and then we started basically getting into war with the bloods you know so then it was a lot of back and forth and a war going on and mm -hmm. But let me ask you something. Let me ask you something. Um, do you think when you were doing this, do you think that the average Barbadian believed that the Crips and the Bloods were in Barbados? No, it didn't. Uh, because once again, when people hear the word gangs, people don't associate gangs with Barbados. Hmm. People so accustomed to hearing crews or yeah, that's a block or that really man is lying. Mm -hmm. So let me hear gangs now. Gang song so foreign. Gang song so like, uh, what those gangs? You know, gangs in Barbados, you know. Um, so it was it was kind of on the radar for a while. But what had happened, what made it on the radar is when we started doing a lot of tagging, which is like spray painting on buildings, the graffiti, where you would then claim you set, which is the gang that you belong to. You start to tag over a particular person to show you territory, basically. So that's basically why, why was that explain for me why was that so important to tag um, in for, that area for, for multiple reasons one it shows that this is the particular territory of this particular gang it also shows for a fact that yeah these people is run this particular section it also shows for a fact that the dominance of the gang basically though it's basically territory 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 yeah yeah, yeah. wow Oh my so, goodness. Um, the thing about the Crips, though, the Crips will intrigue me. It's how organized it was and the structure, the secret handshakes, you know, the, they had little oaths and different things that I was like, oh, it's like you live for your mother, you know, mm -hmm. you live for God, you die for your gang. 
Wow. So uh, you're, you're, um, you said about mother. So all this time, did your family, your your mom, your younger siblings, did they know you were involved in something like this? My mother just thought I just hang around with friends and we just trying to dress a like her. You know, we just go out and see him. I guess the fashion sense or whatever. She thought mm -hmm. it was like time. She didn't know how serious it was at the time, though. She didn't know how serious it was. Um, I think she eventually got really so serious it was coming on as the height I got to the ranks. It began, she started to realize some signs and she said people started telling her, you know, you sound like gang though. And you know, she would hear it and then she was like, hmm. And the more and more she heard it, she started to believe it. She started to see like more men come and hang around me, people coming to show me, you know. Different so you, how did you feel as, as a young man? You know, yeah. you're a young man and you, you're now moving up the ranks and uh, uh, what what do you, uh, did it do anything to your self-esteem or you felt scared? It how did you feel? It, it, boost, it basically boosts my self-esteem because one, rather than look at it as a gang, look at, right, we look at it in the point of view of that young man and I point of view that young man is like, this is your family, you know? This is you try, this is who you really belong to. So we were looking up for one another, basically. We didn't look at it as something like a destruction or we just trying to be, you know, oh here just doing the worst. We're just looking at this. We family, we just look up for each other. So even okay. if somebody you don't know, even if somebody that you don't know, you saw with the flag or whatever, you would throw that new gang sign. And then before you all know it, y'all hanging out, y'all chilling, y'all getting something to drink. You know what I mean? So it was like a togetherness kind of way that was very, very different from the culture that we had in Barbados wow oh my goodness listen i only have can you believe this is so interesting i only have 11 more minutes in this interview because mr Kazel franklin is coming up um but i i wanted to i want to ask you what was the worst experience you could say that you ever had being in this gang um i had two bad experiences one is where one of my best friends was killed where he was beaten with a baseball bat and he was stabbed multiple times yeah, and then to watch it being a coma, then eventually losing him. That did something to me mentally. That is what actually turned me into the beast, beast, beast. That like, yeah, that did something to me. That hard in my heart. And uh, then the next worst experience when it was also stabbed, was stabbed five times as well. And I was in hospital. And I think it was, at the time, it really wasn't my worst experience because they saw it as, all right, this is, as I was like, to be honest with you, I was prepared for death. I when you say you, you were prepared for death, I mean you didn't fear death? Because I saw, yeah, I, yeah, I saw too many, too many of my friends dying, too much, too many of my friends going to jail. Um, eventually, you just tell yourself, yourself is next. You, you next. And the amount of worries I was in, and the amount of things that I was involved in at the time, I know it's just only a matter of time before it come to me. And then not only that, I was also told that it was a hit on my head. And someone had came in to basically kill me. And the news was then brought to me. So anyway, I was kind of prepared for it. I was psyched up myself every single day in different ways to, all right, if I'm going out, this is how we're going to go out. So when it happened to me at the time, and I survived, I just thought that I was just built for this. And it kind of, it, it kind of like amplified my rep at the time. Oh, and, so you moved, you moved up in rank because you were stabbed five times. Yeah, at that time, I was, at that time I was the OG as well, one of the youngest OGs at the time. So I actually had my own crew, and then I left the Crips afterwards over a situation. I wanted to retaliate, I wanted to go and shoot this guy. We saw the guy, it was in the midst of a whole bunch of people. And the guys I was with was like, my Lord, children, it was at the Olympus at the time, man. It was like, my Lord, children, the cameras and things at the end. I was like, I don't care, this is the man that stabbed me, you know. And, I wanted to shoot the guy at the time. And then I was like, nah, this isn't a good idea. And you know, being hot headed and stuff like that, it was vexed. And I was like, you know what? I yoked to this crypt thing. And I eventually started something called Street Soldiers. Uh, the yes, thing I remember that. I remember that. So right. then you left the crypt and started your own um, called Street Soldiers. But before you go on, I, I want everybody to hear what he said earlier that after he saw his best friend um stabbed up beaten with a baseball bat and and um died how it hardened his heart you know and he wanted revenge 
and how he got stabbed up five times and he didn't care for his life he you know for him and and, and then when he saw the guy who stabbed him how he wanted to kill i want us to keep that in the back of our of, of our heads okay because that is really i believe what we're dealing with in these 33 um murders that we saw but continue please um yeah and, and then so basically i was i was ready to crash up so remember i started i went up and i was like as a street soldier over this script thing and people was asking was a street soldier and at the time when i said it i remember how posted it it was msn and stuff at the time going on i remember how posted it. it wasn't supposed to be a gang it's just that i was just a street soldier but then people was like so what's this and i was like you know what I can let people know. So I created my own little set of rules. I was recruiting blow of bloods and crepes. And the crew grew ridiculously fast. Um and yeah, we started from then that whole street soldiers was then born. And then I remember there was then an article that was talking about, you know, the most 10 most notorious gangs in Barbados. And the street soldiers was 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 in the article. And I felt proud. I felt like, you know, yeah, like this is what we're talking about. You know, and um, but in all honesty, though, in all honesty, what happens is that when you find yourself witnessing so much loss and you find yourself losing so many people around you, and eventually it hardens your heart, and there's so much trauma and thing that you've been dealing with that eventually it's just be a killed or be killed mentality. A weakness is like a is like a character flaw. So to have feelings for somebody to think about the consequences was a character flaw. So learning how to act without thinking or learn to act without thinking that the consequences was the only way he was basically going to survive because you knew for a fact that if you basically left the streets or if you show weakness your time was up mm, wow 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 so you know with just a couple more minutes to go i mean who, who would like to sit and talk to him the whole night <laughs> but you know um i i want to ask you how did you decide to leave the gang street soldiers you started it and then you decided to leave it why yeah this is when then now marcerix came into place <laughs> um, really? this is where he was doing where it was the hush film yes this is where now hush the hush was now introduced with the really beauty hush film and i remember that sophia was like you won't be part of this film and remember like we did the film we shoot the film and what's not and the thing about it when the film came out there was a particular when i had shot the guy in the head a lot of people was glorifying it and people couldn't tell the difference between movie and reality at the time a lot of young people because that was basically the kind of life that i was living so what really had hit me that day was a particular time you had invited us to come to the olympus to talk to the students yes i remember so hold a right. minute so when 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 we actually recruit when we auditioned you to be in the movie hush you oh, were saying part of the gang. you are still part of the gang yeah oh lord of mercy look at this thing i had no idea people truthfully <laughs> i had no idea and so there was a scene i remember because my son my son played the boy yeah um, the, the boy the, the character um dan he played a character that you guys shot mm -hmm. jj remember yeah. JJ? so you yep. guys in the movie this is a movie guys a movie so they shot jj and 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 what tell us what happened to you when that when that that happened in the film right so then i remember going on and we was talking to the we was talking to the students but it was just one particular school that really touched my heart it was it was two incidents it was right well first we start with this it was when it was the school channel school Charles school had came to the olympus mm -hmm. and after the after talking to the students i remember some guys coming to me and said they want to be just like me they want to be just like me and you understand know me and knowing that my mother was threatened my sister was threatened the life that i was living thinking that the police gonna hold me thinking that i can get killed after hearing them in the situation that they were in at the time you know, being having disabilities and stuff like that, looking up to me, who was just prepared to to do when he time is up. Um, that hit me. That had really touched my heart at the time. And I was like, I can't continue doing this here anymore. And it was your husband. I, I will never forget this day. The weeks he came to me and he was like, You see that you're a leader though. And then I will never forget this day. He was talking about God and giving my life to God and how to get impact people in a much positive way. And I gave my life to Christ in the Olympus that day outside um you know he came and he sat down and he was patient with me and he talked to me 
and he wasn't preaching at me at the time. And then eventually gave my life to Christ. I ain't get this God thing a try. And I did. And the funny thing about it, we really proved <laughs> so really proved God was really real. That afterwards now I remember saying, All right, cool, man, I can't continue living this way, I can't continue leading these people to destruction. And then it was the Lord school who had came and I had told them that I ain't a part of that life anymore. And people was like, if you're not a part of that, day, I ain't a part of this anymore. And I did that. And it was like, well, it that easy for people. So then eventually he said, I ain't give this God thing a try. And it's other one of y'all had to invite me to come. And there was a guy who was giving his testimony. He was a deportee as well. Weeks. Oh, when, you know, you know, the yes. funny thing, I'm sure Dave doesn't remember one thing about this. I, I, yeah. I remember you coming to speak to the the students at the cinema. Yeah. Um, you know, because a lot of people see me doing these kind of things, but they don't know that we've been working with young men, right, for um, years. But continue the story. <laughs> yeah. So then I remember I was in town. You know, I tell the man, man, I ain't living our life no more. And it was in town, I was walking through town. And then I saw my enemies, which you will call your ops. It was like 20 of them. And they saw me. And they approached me to start taking out the weapons. I was walking towards me. was like, yeah, we got you now, boy. You died today. And I remember saying, God, if you're ready, you got to come true for me. I ain't going to run. I ain't going to fight back. I ain't going to retaliate. If this is what it's supposed to be, this is what it's supposed to be. I remember boys telling me just cross the road. And a cross the road and a cross the road. They saw they cross the road as well. And I was like, all right, I guess this is it. And miraculously, a car just pulled up. And a man told me, get in. And I was like, huh? Man, tell me, get in. We got in the car, but he started to run the car and he managed to scratch off. And this is where Praise Academy was located and Kate was laying at the time. And me and this man did not speak. I did not know this man. We, I just in the box, like, what the hell just happened? And he led me straight to Praise Academy. And I was like, and I, he tell me, get out. I get out. I was like, what the hell happened here? Like, I kind of understand it. You know, I, I just kind of understand it. So I went upstairs and the same time I went upstairs, Wayne Weeks was giving a testimony. Mm -hmm. All right, you just tell me sit down, I went upstairs and he was giving a testimony and it was like, have a seat. I sat down and then he was giving his testimony. His testimony really spoke to my heart at the time. He was and, a deportee. He was a deportee. Yeah. I remember. And he was talking about his life. And it's like, I mind in a thousand different places where, you know, I supposed to be dead. How this way this man dropped me here. Who is this man? You know, and at the end of the testimony, Wayne Weeks came and touched me on my shoulder and said, Don't worry about it, you're gonna get through. I was like, Who tell this man about me? Who, who, who this man know who's me? And it was just too many queens. It was like everything just was like I was like, This God God be real, you know. This God God be real. And then I remember then afterwards, I got involved then in Praise Academy of Dance, and it was getting involved in dance and stuff like that. And that was kind of like my outlet in a sense now to be in a different environment, you know. Um, Venture started building my faith a little more. It wasn't always easy. And it started building things of God. And I was able to release a lot of my anger and frustration through dance. And it helped in so many different ways. And that is one of the reasons why I came, I, I came out. I was like, if it's supposed to happen, it will happen. If I supposed to die this way, uh, I, I, I die this way. At least I dying for a right cause, and that was yeah. what that was the main reason how we came out. Or, yeah, was the reason why we basically came out to the gang, the gang like. Wow, wow! You know, would you believe Zico? I, I, I'm sure you probably told us, but I honestly did not remember. I, it was while we were doing the the interview on CBC. Then I said, "Oh yes, I remember you were in Hush." Yeah. And and I remember Hush, but I didn't. I didn't. Uh, no, actually, what I remembered not that you were in Hush. I remember that you were speaking to the young people at the at, at Olympus. But I didn't yeah. realize um, that when you were in Hush, you were actually in a gang already. Um, so boy, this is, this is really, um, really, really, um, powerful. And, you know, I'm glad that you were able to share your story tonight. And somebody's asking if Matthew Farley played the principal. Yes, he's passed now, but Matthew Farley did play the principal, um, in that movie. And a lot of people, a lot of young men, 
um, you know, lives were turned around from those movies. And, you know, we're hoping, um, Zico, with this new, um, what we're uh, we're embarking on, because you're reminding me of so many things. And as I tell you, I'm sure Dave doesn't remember these things. I remember, what I remember is that he used to have the, he used to have these parties for you all at night, uh, um, yeah. late. Pray and zone, it, yeah. We call them pray zone. And we play yeah. like, not all Christian music, but like wholesome music. And you all would come and dance and people would do fish cakes and everything uh, for you all. And the no drinking. And then then he would we would get people to drop you all home, all because we wanted to make sure that we had a safe place for you and yeah. that you are, you know, you are not not in gangs or anything. Well, Zico, we're going to hear more from you tomorrow, aren't we? Yes, definitely. Definitely. What's the last thing you want to say to the people before Mr. Franklin comes? Yeah. I just want to encourage everybody to continue to have faith, continue to pray for the youth and be patient with you. Continue to plant these seeds. I know you may tell yourself you're talking to the young men and you know you're telling them to change their life and you may tell yourself you're getting through. But trust me, the seeds are being planted and sometimes it just takes one situation, you know, that it can actually manifest and actually change that young person's life. And even when you tell yourself that uh, you give up hope and you don't ever think that it can happen, now just continue. I'm going to encourage every single person to come out tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be very pinnacle. We really need to speak to the issues that's going on in terms of violence. We really need to continue to petition for these young men and these young women. And I just want to encourage every single person to don't give up faith on the youth. Don't, don't, don't give up faith on them. If I could change, anybody could change. Yes, yes. And 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 let me just say here that the National Longitude, Longitudinal Survey of Youth in the USA said that um, youth who attend faith-based gatherings, services, mosques, churches, temples are 39% less likely to commit crimes, 57% less likely to deal drugs. Mm -hmm. That's just the, just the statistics and we're hearing um, Zico's, um, Zico's story. And, to add to that, and, and even to add to that before we leave, um, one of the reasons why is that they too, because when you misdirect, when you direct them into a more positive light, something that they can believe and find themselves and find their identity, eventually start to find a purpose. Wow. Wow. Um, I hope you all come out to hear Zico tomorrow. He's going to finish all of this up tomorrow. Thank you, Zico, for joining us. Right. God for bless you. Well. Yes. Right, thank you. And I could listen to you the whole night because it's a story of hope. It's a yeah. story of transformation. All right. So thank you so much. God bless you.